This is Peggy Batten. She's, her story is about Brooke, and I don't want to steal that, so she's very capable of telling this story. Um, but she has been in the field um, of bioethics and um, philosophy uh, for many, many years, which I'm sure you'll uh, share a little bit as well. But um, this story is one of the most compelling and compassionate messages that any of us will ever hear. So I, I really invite you to welcome uh, Peggy Batten to the stage. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a, um, it's an honor to be here. And all of you know more about what goes on in the background of this story than I possibly can. Although I've considered myself a um, professional in, this, in some areas of death and dying stuff, this story came as a surprise. Uh, this is a story about a little boy named Brooke Hopkins who grew up to be a college professor. There he is as an assistant professor at Harvard with the uh, kid of the colleague who's taking the picture. And then he moved to Utah and fell in love. Now I did too at the same time. You can see us there. <laughs> he was um, an English professor. His field was uh, romantic poetry. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, those guys. And his particular interest, I think, in um, uh, romantic poetry was this notion of the growth of the poet's mind. Central uh, thing, a central, compelling, lifelong interest. There's Wordsworth, his favorite, right? Meanwhile, I was doing bioethics. Uh, I was always interested in um, end of life issues, death and dying, assisted suicide, euthanasia, uh, all those um, heavy topics. I knew a lot about um, the century of change and changes in how we die. Done a lot of historical work on issues about um, suicide and um, other end of life issues. Um, and I knew that things had changed, as all of us uh, do, so that we now die comparatively slowly, predictably at later, less somewhat predictably at later points in life and of stuff that the uh, physician can do quite a lot to at least uh, postpone or stave off, right? I knew that this picture, this is George Washington on his deathbed. He went out riding, uh, caught, he didn't change his wet clothes. It had been snowing uh, and sleeting in uh, December of 1799. Didn't change his clothes before dinner, uh, caught a cold, <coughs> turned into pneumonia and was dead in two days. That doesn't happen anymore, right? That's not the picture. This is the stereotype picture that lots of our um, traditional views about death and dying are based on, right? That, look at that wonderful deathbed scene. Isn't that lovely? Uh, but that's not the way it is. I also knew this famous slide. This is from Joanne Lynn. Uh, this is an old slide, uh, but I show it because it had such influence on the field. The top is the uh, trajectory uh, for uh, cancer. Pretty good, quick drop off uh, for organ system failure with exacerbations and remissions until one of them becomes uh, fatal and dementia and uh, frailty down at the bottom. Joanne, I'm sure you have uh, revisions to this slide. This is from 2005, but it's here because it was so influential in much of um, bioethics thinking. And the problem, as I said, is that uh, many of our religious and cultural traditions were formed at an earlier stage of this transition. And that's part of what uh, we face um, as we um, face dying now. I also knew about strategies for negotiated death from DNR orders and withholding and withdrawing treatment. This is a timeline of political controversy, right? Uh, as well as um, legality. So the top ones were originally controversial and then recognized as legally um, permissible uh, down through uh, that line uh, just below terminal sedation. Uh, arm's length of physician-assisted dying is now legal in Oregon, Washington, uh, apparently in Montana, yes in Vermont, and at the moment in New Mexico. Um, it's hard to say how long that will last. It will be under appeal. Uh, and the ones below it are controversial in this country, although uh, not everywhere. They're all practiced here, however, whether they are legal or not. And that's been the focus of a lot of my interest over the years. Now, we had our fields, but we also had a pretty good time. 
as Hit said, this is a love story. There we are on some island somewhere. We hiked a lot. I'm on the other end of this um, camera. It's a little scary up in those mountains, but wonderful. We had a good time. We tried to figure out what um, cafe that was in. We couldn't figure out even which country. We'd <laughs> been in so many places <laughs> like that. <laughs> and we loved each other. Then in November 2008, uh, this is um, seen from a news helicopter overhead. Brooke had a double bicycle accident. He was uh, going downhill and bike racer was coming uphill around a blind corner. You can see his feet sticking out down at the bottom there as the uh, paramedics worked on him. And here he is in the uh, hospital, broke his neck at C2, C3 and was nearly completely uh, paralyzed. There's some efforts at um, rehab, but he spent over, the, over this uh, course of this time, uh, two years and two weeks in various units of um, uh, inpatient um, hospitals, not counting a lot of later readmissions. Now, he was a literature professor. Uh, we had read The Odyssey many times. And if you remember The Odyssey's, the, the drive of Odysseus is to get home, right? He's been gone for 10 years fighting the Trojan War, and then when he finally leaves Troy, it's another 10 years before he gets home. He's able to spend one night there before he has to keep moving, but at least he makes it home. And this is of classic stories, the most compelling about the urge to reach home. Why is it important? Well, in the meantime, in the practical world, there are a lot of uh, challenges in coming home. Here are some of the things you have to do. My favorite, though, is this one uh, down here. The, uh, we had multiple inspections from home modification agencies, government and private, and from hospitals. <laughs> we had at least five inspections of everything. No one ever looked at the electrical outlets. These were, uh, it's an old house, ungrounded outlet with a spaghetti of wires uh, coming out, um, covering all, especially the uh, respiratory equipment. Right, some other challenges in coming home, hiring and training staff. Um, respiratory therapists were a particular challenge. We were told it was illegal to hire a respiratory therapist privately. Right, illegal. Well, that just seemed like a little bit of um, something you wanted not to pay attention to. Finally, we found one, uh, but the good news was she was a licensed respiratory therapist who said, I'll work for you. Um, but all her friends were respiratory therapists also, so suddenly we had uh, five or six on our staff. Uh, there's the um, other, oops, other problems include um, calculating uh, the um, uh, costs, maintaining contact with the physician, very difficult in a home situation. Uh, securing medical services, including drawing labs uh, without needing to make a clinic visit. This is a patient who's extremely hard to transport and getting adequate pain management and access to palliative care at home, um, particularly uh, difficult. But just the same, it was home. So we knew about the uh, clinical advantages of home, right? Reduced infection rates. We had a dedicated staff uh, with a single patient. Uh, we had our own equipment, two ventilators, other respiratory equipment. We had a ceiling lift uh, and not a coir. Uh, and a, this was the most important item of all in my view, this bariatric width bed, which I bought secondhand out of somebody's garage somewhere. Uh, but it was the single, except for the ventilator, um, most important thing. Uh, there's our respiratory equipment. There's our pharmacy. There's our oxygen supply, along with some concentrators. There's Brooke doing some home PT, right? There's our overhead lift, right? That's also very important for the staff. And there's Brooke in the lift. He didn't always have that uh, nasal cannula. He had a peg tube later on, but uh, there he is. He was able to teach. He's using his um, microphone here for Dragon, uh, so you could do um, 
he could dictate and have it come up on the screen. He's teaching, this was a hard moment, he's teaching Dante here. Yeah, he taught the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Dante, um, Chaucer, um, Wordsworth, Shakespeare, uh, and a lot of other things over time. He taught these at home to a group of utterly adoring students. In fact, they were so adoring that that class still continues. We kept a blog, uh, and this was a serious project between the two of us. Um, loss. This, we, we did this over and over again. Loss. It's quite a difficult period coming home, and even though I've been home over a month, it's still difficult. It makes you reflect on loss and the hope of game. Think of things like Matthew. You have to lose yourself in order to find God. Or the winter tale. There's Perdita, the lost daughter, found. Or the ending of The Tempest. These are Shakespeare plays. Gonzalo's speech on losing and finding. Or Thoreau in the Walden chapter, The Village. It's not until we are lost, that is to say, turned around, that we discover ourselves in the infinite extent of our relations. They are all about loss. Of course, I've gained a lot in coming home, but the sense of pervasive loss is still acutely real. I'm in mourning, you might say. Now, we were able to write these blogs. This is obviously Brooke's voice. Because we could lie in bed, in that bariatric width bed, I'd have my keys on the um, keyboard, but he'd talk, I'd write, I'd finish the sentence in my own words or the other way around. And this, this physical circumstance of being able to be together and in the same place with intimate contact. Now mind you, intimate doesn't mean hanky-panky. This guy is completely paralyzed, but intimate. And I stress that because it's something that never otherwise gets talked about. Poems have blank spaces. He thinks of words. This is a time for deep emotional sounding and exploration of the abyss that may lie below the surface. It's hard, homecoming. Oddly enough, writing this blog right, has brought us much closer together. When you think about the things that people who have otherwise no function uh, may be able to do, this is it. Perhaps we need this blog for ourselves as much as we thought we were doing it for you. Now, for many people, there are barriers to coming home. Their home might not be uh, adequate. Not, you didn't own it. You can't modify it. It's too far away from healthcare. We were five minutes from a tertiary uh, hospital, in fact, one that was ranked number one in the country a couple of years ago. Um, Inadequate facilities uh, might be the case and so on, right? No family, an abusive or pathological family or immigration problems, uh, no home respiratory coverage we mentioned, and home care grossly inadequate for Brooks' level of injury. The idea was to teach the family. I was the only family member um, in, the, in that city. Uh, but uh, we... Um, our first home care nurse from a home care company spent one month putting together a book on spinal cord injury, which if we hadn't already known, he would have died the first day, right? That's how effective that particular home care project was. But it was home. Even in the winter when the vines overhead weren't growing, it was still home. So we tried to make it as nearly normal a life as possible your own schedule, your own foods, your own treatment and bathing routines. You can do what you want. You can read what you want, and something is missing from this, but you can get straight cast right in your living room if you want without interruption. These things make a difference. And you can have your own aesthetic design. So we worked really hard to avoid that institutional look. So this is the shower chair that was recommended to us. In fact, we were supposed to uh, purchase this. Uh, and despite the price tag, if you can't read it in the back, it says $2,865. This is our shower chair. 
that, that's an REI lawn chair, and it's got, but it's got fancy $50 casters on the bottom. So total price, $150. But it does do everything that an ordinary shower chair does, and besides, it's mesh, and you can shower right through it. All right, that's our blanket warmer. That's our art collection on the wall. Wouldn't see that in a facility. You can invite whomever you want to dinner. Uh, this is um, me cooking as best I can, but here's the table, which is, as was in fashion at that point, a high table so that you can roll a big, heavy um, power wheelchair underneath it, and everybody sits with their heads and conversation at the same height. That was also extremely uh, important. You notice other high chairs around this house. Uh, this one came from a garage sale somewhere, as many others did. But the idea was to make it as, make contact between this person and other people as close and uh, intimate as possible. You can go outside whenever you want. That was also important. Can't do that in an institution most of the time. There were uh, social advantages, right? You can go where you want. In some places, uh, you might be limited to four outside trips per year, the one he spent a year and three quarters in. Uh, family may have private space, too, so you don't have to conform to institutional visiting hours, non-personal spaces. And the family and loved ones, I think this is, captures what it is, that your loved ones live with you instead of just visiting you. Now, of course, uh, I had to make another little bedroom for myself. There it is. But I could keep my office in its accustomed style. <laughs> and my reminder system was especially important. <laughs> All right. We had um, the social advantages of home included. Uh, and this also seemed particularly important. There was just reference made to um, bad pay for um, the lowest echelon healthcare workers. Because we were self-paying, we could pay what we wanted. So we tried to pay reasonably. And we tried to have reasonable pay policies. So none of that, your shift is canceled because our patient uh, you know, census is down, or uh, come in for two hours and uh, then go away. Uh, we could have more flexible hours. We could do uh, better benefits we wanted. We could give people six weeks paid maternity leave. Uh, we had a sense of family, and it's especially important, no need for that professional distance that comes with lots of nursing and other medical uh, training. We had, um, in our staff, we had a couple of folks who went to nursing school during this time. And of course, they'd be in nursing school for a couple of weeks, and then this would be the next lesson, so they'd get all distant and remote. <laughs> It usually lasts about a month. It was agonizing for everybody, uh, and then would go away. Here's our staff. In fact, uh, these four in the front and the one whose head is a little obscured uh, are all respiratory therapists. She's a CNA with about seven years of um, uh, nursing home experience. These two are pre-med students. This one's a mid-level EMT. And this guy is a drywaller. He was the best drywaller in the state, it was said. And he was working in our house on modifications. I overheard him say, the drywall industry is collapsing. I'm thinking of going into healthcare. And so, <laughs> there he is. He was great. There's our scheduling system. There's our financial uh, office. Right, there's the staff lounge, right? <laughs> Uh, there's our transportation system. This was also important because it meant that the staff could take Brooke anywhere they wanted, right, whenever he wanted. All this time we were keeping this blog. We kept it quite regularly on many, many topics. Life will never be the same. We know that. But nobody's life is not is quite the same as time goes on. Ours, fortunately, is getting better from its awful lows. A night or two ago, we went out for dinner at the home of some friends. This was the first time we've been able to go to a private home. Part of the reason for that is that uh, in a sort of mountainous city like that, in fact, most places, um, houses have front steps. They have inside steps, right? This was one, these people uh, went to a tremendous amount of effort to try to rig up a way, sorry, that we could go 
to um, and sit on the porch. Couldn't manage to get inside the house, but it was summer. Sit on the porch that overlooks the city. We have this wonderful view of the Utah State Capitol. Looks just like the one here. Uh, and it prods you to think about the political maneuverings that go on inside. So we sidestepped that in favor of a discussion about something deeper. What, what about things you wish you had done in your life but hadn't? And then, of course, people talk about trips. Well, I always wanted to go to, um, you know, Hawaii, or I always wanted to go to um, uh, Argentina, or I always wanted to go to Nepal. Uh, but then we turn to kinds of things that we wished we'd done that don't require locomotion. What kinds of mental things did you always want to do but never got around to? We never ask ourselves that question. Or when we ask people about their bucket lists, the bucket lists are always things that require activity, travel, uh, or something of the sort. Someone said something about liberation, about being liberated. This was actually a much longer conversation with many more entries. But it touched something in me, Brooke said, the stark disparity between par being paralyzed, being confined to a wheelchair, and unable to go most places to travel any great distance. We did take some uh, road trips. Um, and a certain liberation of mind or spirit, if you can call it that. And it came on to me, he thinks of Coleridge's great poem, this lime tree bower my prison, right? which begins this way. Well, they are gone and here I must remain this lime tree bower, my prison. I have lost such beauties and such feelings as had been most sweet to my remembrance. So he's in its garden, he's had an accident. Um, his friends have visited him and then gone walking in the paths that he has always traveled. He can imagine them, see them climbing the hill and then des descending down into this glade, but then realizes a new kind of, um, sorry, of joy. It's a joy, he says, in their joy. They can see these things even though he cannot, right? A delight comes sudden on my heart and I am glad as I myself were there. There's much more to this, so um, let me skip over a little bit in the interest of time. Uh, but this sense of confinement and liberation is what's essential here. We also um, found this in Canada from the British Mobility Opportunities Society. It was designed by the then mayor of Vancouver and said to have been sketched on a cocktail napkin. It's called a trail rider. Uh, it's got a central wheel that's actually like a wheelbarrow wheel and two Sherpas, one on the front and the back. Uh, and this. This contraption has, one like it, has been to the top of Kilimanjaro twice and also once to base camp at Everest. So you can go lots of places. Here we are uh, out in the woods uh, and there's somebody reading, uh, I think that is um, Proust, right, to us, right? And here we are in the foothills, right? So you try to make life as nearly normal as you can, even for somebody in this situation. Now, you're probably figuring out that our experience isn't representative, right? We were enormously lucky, right? And so, this talk is about how things might be if we did it better. It's surely harder for almost everybody else. Well, here's some things that made it work. We had great insurance, double, co in fact, quadruple coverage. Uh, we had resources to cover the staff and other costs, there are the figures. Uh, if you want to spend your retirement savings, this is one way to do it. Uh, I have a um, secure, flexible, and tenured job as a college professor. Nobody has those, right? We have to remember the impact on people's um, uh, employment situations. We had wonderfully loyal and dedicated family. We had a physician willing to support this arrangement and in particular, willing to allow our staff to legally report to him, 
right? Whether or not it was legal to hire the uh, respiratory therapist or not, I don't know, but that's, um, here's what he said as makes a good spinal cord doc. I try to allow people to be normal. And above all, love. And this sounds corny, but this was central in this. So the nemesis, of course, was policies, practices, and uh, incentives that determine whether a patient's at home. I'll just r run through these a little bit. This was a big deal in hospitals or when we tried, when we had sometimes um, uh, home care through services. These folks can't do everything. Our 12-person staff, the folks you just met, all of them were trained to do everything. All of them did all respiratory care. They could do trach changes. They all did bowel care. They could do rescue care. They did everything a CNA, an RN, and a respiratory therapist uh, do. Um, there's the homebound dilemma. You all know about that, right? And the practical result uh, is that um, often the case that people with significant disabilities can't go out. One home care company, after an inpatient uh, bout, um, discharged Brooke involuntarily and with no notice because he'd been taken to see a one hour and 15 minute documentary at a movie theater. Now, that doesn't come within the guidelines, but that's what happened. And uh, that's more frequent, I understood, than most. The usual result is, and this is what somebody said to me when we were shopping around, well, most people just put him in long-term care. Put M, that's a person, right? You know this too, right? There are many advantages to inpatient institutional care, right? Uh, and in a really good facility, there may be a sense of commitment and family. Uh, you know the bottom line there too, right? It's still the choice of the case that these questions, these um, policies tilt towards institutionalization. So I think the challenge here is the question of where a person feels most at home. It's not the case that everybody will feel most at home at home. Some homes are terrible, right? And being out of it is a relief, right? Some institutions are terrible and being at home is a relief. So that's an individual question, not a, as far as I can see, a policy question. So, this was actually a nice a life that transformed, but pleasurable in a much deeper and closer way. Friends came, family came, former colleagues, students. We had, uh, there's a little uh, space in the garden where friends who were in bands would come and play in, in the summer. We had some good times out on the deck listening to them, All right? Then though, there was another pneumonia. There had been multiple pneumonias. Uh, the same routine, the ER, the ICU, the step-down unit, the inpatient rehab unit. Uh, and then there, each time this happened, there was a longer period of um, recovery. There is more. We talked about whether we would retract the choices we made. Uh, would either of us retract any of this? Rook says no. He doesn't want to retract anything, even though at some of the most painful times he said he wanted to die. And I said I wouldn't want to retract anything either. And despite the arduousness of this um, almost five-year period, right, we wouldn't change that given what it's um, done. But the physical challenges and the medical challenges became more and more uh, difficult and things began to go downhill. Brooke knew what he didn't want and this is what he didn't want. He was completely adamant that he did not want to go back to the hospital and he absolutely did not want to die in the hospital. He absolutely did not want to die in the hospital. He wrote numerous documents, filed them with the lawyer, had the doctor sign off on them, all of that stuff, right? Uh, but he knew what he didn't want. He knew the very fine line between 
allowing to die and causing to die. That's because partly because of my interest. We'd been talking about this stuff for 30 years. Right? And he knew he had the legal and moral right to refuse or discontinue treatment he no longer wanted. Here's what he had. He had a diaphragmatic pacer. He had a cardiac pacer. He had a peg tube. He had supplemental oxygen and he had a ventilator, which he did. He refused them. This is him the morning the hospice, he spent uh, three hours with his regular uh, spinal cord physician who then referred him to hospice and this is the morning that the hospice physician said, yes, I will help you discontinue the ventilator. You see there's a slightly forced smile on my face there, but that was his reaction, right? I will help you, she said. That was the morning that he died. But he counted himself as lucky. He could die when he wanted. He could die with the help of a physician, that is in assisting in removing the, discontinuing the ventilator and all the other, most of the other stuff. Uh, a hospice physician. Um, and I must say, our son said, in, who works in various areas of healthcare, <laughs> And all, and meets hundreds of physicians. This is the physician with the best bedside manner I have ever seen. A hospice physician, a nurse, and uh, our respiratory therapist also. He could die at home with family and friends around him. And he could die with the one who loved him most, lying by his side in that big wide bed. So that's the love story that began here.